All right, let's get into the Word this morning. We're busy with a series on marriage. This is the second part to the series. This guy was uh, speeding on the highway, and he was just going for it when he noticed some blue lights in his, in his mirror. And so he decided to just take off and to, and to try and outrun this, this uh, tra- traffic car. And so this is, this is what he did. And a couple of moments later, he realized, what am I doing? And so he just pulled off. And a little while later, the cop pulled in behind him and, and came walking over to his window. And this guy, just, he, you know, this guy was upset. And he said, what, what, what were you thinking? He said, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, officer. I, I wasn't thinking. So this guy said to him, he says, you know, I've, I've had such a long day. It's been a, it's been a long shift, and I've got 15 minutes before I'm knocking off. And so I, I, I don't want to book you, but if you can give me an excuse that I've never heard before, then I'll let you go. So without hesitating, this guy said to him, he said, you know, my wife ran off last week with a traffic officer, and I thought you were bringing her back. I want to start off this morning with just a little bit of humor, all right? Because a little bit of sugar makes the medicine go down, all right? And so maybe, maybe you find yourself here this morning where, ah, you know, it's a little bit tough in your marriage at the moment. And maybe you even had a little bit of a boxing contest, you know, in the car driving to church. It's crazy how those things happen. You're on your way to church, you're on your way to cell group or something like that, and, and suddenly there's just this disagreement, you're like, where did that come from? But I want to say to you, it's okay, it's okay. Somebody once said, uh, marriage was made in heaven, so was lightning and thunder, all right? And so maybe you are going through a little bit of lightning and thunder, but I want to say to you, it's a, it's a part of life, and we've got to learn how to handle it and how to work through it, and that's one of the reasons that, that we're talking about this this morning. And, and as you know, we, we, we touch on marriages. We try and do it every single year. We, we try and do a series on marriage. It's just so important. Now, last week we looked at the foundation of a happy and a strong marriage. And just like a, a house, you can build a house without the foundation. And nobody will even know it because the foundation is below the ground. You don't even know there's no foundation. And the house looks good. And the house even looks beautiful. <laughs> but it won't stand the test of time. Because, because with time and through the storms and everything, it's eventually going to start cracking and breaking. And it'll, it'll probably implode in itself. And so it's exactly the same in marriage. If you don't have the right foundation, it may look good initially. But it's unfortunately not going to stand the test of time. And so if you, for some reason, missed last week, just get the CD or the DVD before you leave and and, and just just get into that. so important that we know what the right foundation is. This morning, I want to go a step further, and I want to share with you quickly four habits, four habits of successful marriages. And and I'm not expecting you to try try and remember all four. I'm asking you this morning, pick one. How's that? Just pick one. Because you may look at the first one and say, I don't quite agree with that. Leave it. You may look at the second one and say, we're kind of okay with that one. And the third one, you're saying, we're great with that one. We're doing that, babes. We're doing that? We're doing that. Fine. We're doing that. All right. And then the fourth one, oh, gosh, we're not doing this one. All right. And so I I want you just, you just pick one this morning. You just look at which one is the most relevant to you and then, and then apply that. What, what is a habit? Why, why, why is it so important that we look at these things? A habit is just simply something that we do without even thinking about it. It's become, a, it's become a, a, so much a part of our life that it's become second nature. It's almost like you get up in the morning uh, and, and you go into the bathroom and you brush your teeth and you walk straight over to the coffee machine. You, you don't even think about it. It's just what you do. For me, I, I do the bathroom routine, and I walk straight over to the torture machine. You know what that's called? The bicycle. And I get on that stupid thing, and I, and I, and I go and ride in, in the morning, and I, and I find Pastor Sid at, at my gate. And I say to him, what are you doing here so early? And so that, that's kind of my routine. That's, that's what I do. And so that's, that's a habit. Now, here's the thing about habits. A habit will predict your future. A habit will predict your future. You see, it's not what you do occasionally. 
what you do every now and again that will predict your future, but, but it's what you do habitually, what you do regularly, what you do all the time. Those things eventually will predict your future. So, so for instance, if you're lazy and undisciplined, I, I, I don't need to be a fortune teller to tell you what your future is going to look like. Ladies, if you're constantly bossing your husband, <laughs> Your, your marriage is not going to look great in the future. I, I can tell you th- that now already. For, for some of the gents, if you're neglecting your, your personal hygiene, and I don't know why this is with, with gentlemen as they get older, but, but, but some of them, not all of them, but some of them start neglecting that area, and they start showering every second day. I, I don't know why. They get into the saving water thing, you know, they very serious about that. But, but, it, but if that's you, I can tell you now already what your sex life is going to look like. It ain't going to happen, all right? <laughs> wow. Because, because our habits predict our future. Here's the second thing you quickly need to know about habits. Habits are really powerful. Habits are really powerful. You see, there's some things that, that you're doing today that, that you didn't do some time ago that you didn't do uh, just after you were born. But at some stage, at some stage in your life, you started doing these things or you stopped doing some things and eventually those things became a habit. And the beauty about good habits is that they'll work for you. Where bad habits will work against you, good habits will work for you. So for instance, Gentlemen, if you're in a, in a habit of, of being nice to the girl, you wake up in the morning, you don't even have to think about it. You don't even, because you're nice to the girl. It's just what I do. It's, it's part of me. It's the culture in our home, culture in our marriage. It'll work for you. If you're in the habit of never raising your voice, you can get into a bit of an argument, a bit of a disagreement. You don't have to raise your voice. You don't have to shout and scream. And so what happens? It works for you. And so good habits always work for us. Good habits are really powerful. And so if you and I can learn to develop good habits in our marriages, you'll find your marriage just becomes more beautiful, more rewarding as time goes on. Now, a marriage that's good is not good because of good chemistry or because you married a good person or because of good luck. It's because of good habits. All right? And so for some of you, this may be some of the best news you're going to hear today. You can, you can change a bad marriage to a good marriage simply by changing your habits. It's as simple as that. All right? And so let's get into it quickly. Let's look at, at a couple of habits, a couple of good habits uh, that uh, successful marriages have. And here's the first one, being unselfish. Number one, being unselfish. Do you know that marriage was created by God? And it was created by Him to be a blessing to you and to make you happy straight after it kills you. (laughs) Listen, it's only when you die that you'll really enjoy marriage. You say, Leonard, hang on, that's crazy. Let me, let me explain it simpler than that. It's only when you die to self that you'll really enjoy marriage. You see, you and I, most of us, we, we selfish by nature. And so it, it's all about me. It's about, it's about whether I'm happy. About whether I'm fulfilled. It's about whether my needs are being met. It's all about me. It's all about selfishness. Here's a great question that you can ask yourself. How do I know if I'm successful in marriage? How do I know whether I'm a good husband or a good wife? It's when your spouse says you are. It it doesn't matter how much you think you're a good husband. You can can walk around saying, "But, but but I'm a good husband. I do that, and I do, and, and I'm a good wife. It doesn't matter how much you think that, how much you say that. You're a good husband or a good wife when your spouse says you are. We cannot measure our success by our own standards, all right? And the, so the success of your marriage and my marriage is going to depend whether we die to ourselves, whether we die to that, that selfishness on the inside. Now, of course, you can be in marriage where you haven't died to yourself. Marriage is good. 
You know, Leonard, I think we have a good marriage. Yes, you know why? It's because he's giving, 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 giving. And you taking, 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 or the other way around. The problem with that is a person that gives and gives and gives cannot keep doing that indefinitely. There comes a time where you get tired, where you're worn out, and where you've just had enough of this. And, and, and it's during that time where you are so vulnerable. And if somebody else comes into your life who suddenly shows interest and who wants to give to you, you're like a sponge. You just want to drink that in and you become vulnerable to affairs and, and all, all kinds of nonsense. You, you're in trouble. Listen, the best marriages are two servants in love. Because really at the end of the day, if you think about it, a, a servant lives to please somebody else. The focus of a servant is always on somebody else, all right? Best marriages, two servants in love. I heard this story once of what heaven looks like and what hell looks like. So in heaven, there's this beautiful banquet table, this beautiful, massive table, and it's loaded with incredible food. And the utensils in front of the people are too long for them to, to feed themselves. There's no ways they can get that into their mouth. And so the only way is to feed somebody else. And so they're having fun. It's great. There's a lot of laughter, and it's just, it's just crazy around this table, but it's great. And in hell, you find exactly the same table and the same utensils. But the people are angry, and they're frustrated because they're busy starving, and nobody will feed somebody else. Do you know it's exactly the same in marriage? You're sitting in front of a banquet table, and you have what your spouse needs. I want to say it again. You have what your spouse needs. And the secret to a happy marriage is to be able to say to your spouse, what are you hungry for? What do you want? What, what, do, you, what do you enjoy? What, what can I give you? Where do you want to go? You see, that's what a, what a happy marriage is at the end of the day. And the worst marriages are, are, are the marriage between, marriages between two selfish people where they just, they, they just you know, out for themselves and just to, just to please themselves. And the best marriages are two servants who, who, who are there just to bless one another and to serve one another. And so if you resent meeting your, your, your spouse's needs, I can tell you now, you'll never have a great marriage. You'll have a marriage. You may even have an okay marriage, but you'll never have a great marriage. The moment you start focusing on how can I be the best husband, how can I meet her needs? What is it that makes her happy? Moment, ma'am, you start doing exactly the same for him. Marriage goes to the next level. And what happens? It's like a little bit of heaven on earth. Now, do you know that the basis of sin is selfishness? Think about it. I want to do what I want to do. And when I want to do it, and, and frankly, I couldn't really care, care about this. I couldn't care about what God says and the church says and the Bible says and all of that because I want to do what I want to do. That's selfish. And the problem is selfishness and marriage. They, they just don't go together. They, just, they don't do this. They, they, just, they, they do that. There's, there's a clash all the time. And some of you know that because, because you grew up in a home where the one parent was extremely selfish. Or you were married to someone who's selfish. Or you are married to someone who's selfish. All right. And so you know it just doesn't work. Marriage and selfishness don't go together. And so we've got to learn to die to self. Let's move on to the second point quickly. Here's number two. Give, yourself, give your spouse the right to complain. Give your spouse the right to complain. And with complaining, I'm not referring to nagging or whining or criticizing. I'm talking about sitting down and talking about something that's not working for you, something that's frustrating you, something that, that you're unhappy about and, and, and you're sitting down. This is probably one of the best habits. Listen to me. 
Probably one of the best habits that you can develop in a marriage. And, and it's so sad how some people just can't do this. Some couples just can't do this. And, and he'll complain to his buddies. And she'll complain to her friends. He always does this. And he never does this. But the problem is they're complaining to the wrong people. They need to complain to the right person. Come together and talk to one another and put it on the table. If you don't do that, that, that marriage is never going to improve. You'll never grow in that marriage. I, I think giving your spouse the right to complain is, is humility in action. Because what you're saying is, I know we don't have a perfect marriage. That's because I'm not perfect. But I want to grow. I want to grow. And I need you to help me grow. You see, I'm not focusing on, 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 on her growth. I'm not focusing on the things she needs to change. I can't change her. I can only change myself. And so I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, I'm committed to being the best husband to Liesl that I possibly can be. But I need her to help me. Let, let me share a secret quickly to the ladies. God has blessed us men with, with many different gifts and abilities. And one of those is the ability to smell. We can smell uh, 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 fragrances and perfumes, but the one thing we, He hasn't blessed us with, we can't smell problems. <laughs> we just, I, well, I don't know why. God, you didn't give us that. We, well, if, if you're unhappy, we can't smell that. If there's a problem in the marriage, we, we just can't smell that. You need to tell us. And don't tell us when we're watching TV. All right? And, and don't tell us when we're on, in the car on the way quickly to work and, and we're in a hurry and there's a hundred other things on our mind. Don't tell us then. You know, I, I've sat with couples over the years going through a difficult time. And she says, I've spoken about this a thousand times. And the guy's like, when? It's the first time I've ever heard about it. How does that happen? I'll tell you how. They never had, if you're taking notes, a formal conversation. You need to have a formal conversation, ma'am. How do I do that? Well, you go to him. You say, honey, we need to talk. <gasps> I'm telling you, you get our attention when you say that. Because we don't know if you're pregnant. <laughs> or moving out. Or your mother's moving in. You got my attention, ma'am. When do we need to talk? This afternoon after work? Is that okay? Can we do it now, maybe? All right? And so we sit this afternoon after work. And you sit. You don't do that while you're doing other stuff. Because guys get distracted. You sit and you look him in the eye. And you tell him, this, this, this deal about your socks lying down on the bathroom floor... This is getting to me. And I promise you, in his mind, he's going, okay, so you're not pregnant, you're not moving on, your mother's not moving in. No problem, babes, I'll do that for you. What else can I do for you? All right, ladies, try it. I promise you, I promise you. You have a formal conversation like that. It's the only way that it works. So you sit down with, with them. And, and it's sad when that, that doesn't work. Uh, I found if someone really has assholes in their marriages, they're not doing this. They just, they're just they not doing this. And it's so easy. And it's so simple. But they're not doing it. Why do we sometimes not do it? Because I tried it once. It didn't work. Then that I've done that, it, it, it didn't work. Uh, maybe it's because, because I tried it. Now I realize. And, and, and he was watching TV or she was busy with the kids. And, 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 and I, I realized maybe the timing was wrong. Or maybe you tried it, but you got the wrong reaction. Your spouse went ballistic. They, 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 just, they just exploded. Or, or, or maybe they became all defensive. Instead of being open and saying, talk to me, they, they just became defensive and excuses and reasons and everything. Or maybe they, they played it down. They, they made it out to be a big joke. And it's sad when that happens. It's sad. Because he walks away, and because he can't complain to the person he needs to complain to, he complains to his buddies, and he says, you know, I, I, I can't speak to her. 
because she'll go ballistic. And we'll have silent treatment for 21 days. <laughs> and she goes to her friends. And instead of complaining to him, she complains to, to them. And she says, you know, uh, it's no use speaking to him. Because he just plays it down. Everything's a joke. He just makes fun of it. It's sad when that happens. It's very sad. You know why? Because they learn to function in their dysfunction. It's like we're just stuck with this nonsense. And we can't seem to talk about it. One of the best habits you and I can develop. Sit down. Have a... Have a a formal conversation, open conversation where you say, honey, give it to me. Talk to me. And where you open to receive from them. A happy marriage is not a marriage where there's no frustrations. A happy marriage is a marriage where frustrations are dealt with, are resolved. All right. And let me say to you, there's a big difference between complaining and criticizing. Complaining and criticizing. All right. The purpose of, of complaining is to rectify the problem. The purpose of criticizing is to, re, is to wreck the person. All right? And if you see that, then you can choose the right one. Complaining rectifies the problem. Criticizing wrecks the person. It hurts the person, humiliates the person. You always do this. You never do that. I'm just, I'm just frustrated. And so what are you doing? You're pointing the finger all the time. You're attacking. You're accusing. That's criticizing. You see, complaining is, is when, when, when you say that or when you do that, this is how I experience it. And, and it feels like I, I'm not good enough. It feels like you know, I, I'm not measuring up or, or whatever the case may be. And so instead of, instead of pointing the finger, you're putting it back on, on me. This is how I'm experiencing it. And you probably didn't mean it that way. It probably wasn't even an intentional. It may even just be a blind spot for you. But this is how I'm experiencing the thing. And, it, and, it's, and it's difficult for me. You see, there's a big difference. We're criticizing, criticizing, pointing the finger. You said that because you probably want to hurt me. Because you're just evil, just like your mother. All right? All right, you get the point. That's criticizing. Let's move on quickly to the next one. Here's number three. Having fun together. And I mentioned it last year in our, in our series last year. And, and, and I want to mention it again. Because I think this is important. Because sometimes we get so caught up in the busyness of life. And, and, and the routine and, and everything. That, that we end up doing life together. And we don't enjoy life together. We do life together. Instead of enjoying life together. And the scary thing is if, if we're not enjoying and we're not having fun and it's not great, our, our marriages are, are vulnerable. Are vulnerable to, to, to affairs and, and, and all kinds of nonsense because, because there's something in us where, where, where we want that. Let's be honest. We need that. But, but it's not happening. And, and, and maybe, maybe you're thinking, oh, Leonard, it'll never happen to me. My husband will never. You know, my, my, my wife will never. Okay. Okay, you can believe that. But I think you'll agree with me that we'd rather be in a marriage that's fun and exciting than an old, stale, boring one. All right? If you had a choice to work uh, in a team at work with, with, with a certain team who, who are having fun and, 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 and it's just great and they're enjoying it and they're getting the job done but they're having fun, or you have a choice to work in this old, boring a team where it's just, ah, oh man, they're getting the job done, but, but it's so boring and the strange people. Where are you going to go? <laughs> You're going to go there, all right? We all would rather want to be in a situation where, we, where we're having fun. Now think about it. This is how you fell in love. This is how the whole thing started. You, you were having fun. You were enjoying one another, and, and you were feeling good about it. Now, Maybe for some of the ladies, you don't know this, and I'm sharing from a man's perspective, because I know a man, because I've always been a man, all right? <laughs> Just in case you were wondering. <laughs> but do you know, do you know, that was a crazy comment, but, <laughs> but do you know that one of the greatest needs of a man is to have a buddy and to have fun together? That's one of our greatest needs. We don't want to be bossed around. 
And we don't want, certainly don't want to be mothered either. And so I want to say to the ladies, if you're doing this, and again, it might, might be a blind spot where you don't even realize it, but, but, but you, you, you're a little bit bossy. You're driving down the road, and you tell him where to turn, or where he shouldn't turn, or where. <laughs> I'm sorry to say this, but you'll never be his buddy. Because you can't be both. And so you've got to choose which one you're going to be. Are you going to be the friend? Are you going to be the buddy? Or are you going to be the boss? And, and, and by the way, don't, don't wait for that, that uh, romantic weekend that we've planned in two, two months' time. And we do that every year. And we go away and we have that romantic weekend. And, and then it's great. And then we treat one another well. And, it, and it's special. But in the meantime... I've seen so many couples in the meantime, man, they're butting one another and they're barking at each other and they, they're impatient with each other. I, I almost want to say, forget the romantic weekend and treat her well every day and take her out every week. I, I'd really recommend, ha have a date night. Every week, some, some couples say, but we just, we're just too busy. We can't do that. And I want to say to you, yes, you are too busy. Because if that's the most important person in your life, second only to Jesus, you better make time for her. You better make time for him, ma'am. And, and let somebody watch the kids do something. And you don't have to go to a fancy restaurant. You don't even have to go to a restaurant. I heard of a younger couple who were literally just sitting out in the patio. And they put the kids down. And, and a specific night they would do that. And they'd have a couple of snacks and stuff. And stuff that they enjoyed. And they kept it very, very simple. And, and it wasn't expensive. But it was a date night for them. Until years later on they could start affording going out and doing things like that. But you see, if, so, if someone or something is important to us, a priority to us, what do we do? We prioritize the time. And so what do we do when, when, we, when we take him out, when we take her out, when we spend time together and you, and you dress up specially and you, and you make it special, you communicate to him or to her, this is very special, you are very special to me. All right, let's move on quickly, the last one, and then we're done for this morning. Here's number four, be a fan. Be a fan. What is a fan? It's a person who's enthusiastically devoted to someone or to something. Another, another word for a fan, if you didn't get that, by the way, just attend the second service, you'll get it, all right? Uh, another word for a fan is a fanatic. Is a fanatic. What is a fanatic? Webster's Dictionary describes it like this. It's someone marked, I love this, someone marked by excessive enthusiasm and often intense and critical devotion. Isn't that beautiful? Excessive enthusiasm and often intense uncritical devotion. Isn't it sad when, when you see some people do exactly the opposite? They're just critical. They're just finding fault. They're just long face all the time. You think, come on, come on. I want to encourage you. Be a fan. Be a fan of your spouse. That means look for the positive. If I had to say to you, is, is, is there negative? Oh, there's plenty negative. But I'm not interested in that because it's not going to help me. And if it becomes really bad, we'll, we'll, we'll handle that in a formal conversation. All right? But in the meantime, I'm not hassled about those things because I'm looking for the positive. And I'm focusing on the positive, and, and I'm a fan. And then I want to say to you, if you're a fan, show it express it, all right? Show it. Express it. You know, I've, I've done funerals over the years, all of our pastors, and, 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 and we've seen a crazy thing. And it's a sad thing. Where you see couples, they, they, they fight, and they're going at one another, and they just, and then, and then the one passes away, and suddenly at the funeral, she's a fan. <laughs> And she shares about him in a way that you're thinking, are we talking about the same guy yeah? <laughs> Will you marry somebody else, you know? It's crazy. It's crazy. 
Let's not wait for somebody's funeral to be a fan. You make up your mind. You know what? God has blessed me with this person, and I'm going to be a fan. And if they're if they, they going to be some minors, minor problems, minor frustrations, let it go. Let it go. If there's majors, have the formal conversation. The, the formal conversation is for the majors. You sit down. Honey, we need to talk. All right? Then you sit down. Otherwise, you be a fan. You start looking for the positive, and you start looking for the things you appreciate, and you start, you start uh, uh, expressing those things. Listen, you start treating your spouse as special. Something special will happen in your marriage. Amen. All right, let's have those four points on the screen quickly. Which one is yours? Which one is yours? Pick one. Being unselfish, giving your spouse the right to complain. This is, this is something that, that I would recommend, that you sit down with your spouse and, and you make an agreement. You say, if there's something that's bugging you, something that's frustrating you, I'm giving you the right to ask me, to speak to me, that we can, we can resolve. Maybe a blind spot in my life, man, I'm not even aware of. So the second one, I'd, I'd recommend that you do that. And then having fun together. Have fun, enjoy it, and of course, be a fan. Come on, let's stand, let's pray together. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, you're awesome. And you've instituted marriage, which, if done your way, is absolutely awesome. And it's rewarding and it's beautiful. And, and really it is a little bit of heaven on earth. And so for those of us in marriage, I ask, Lord, that you help us to be a blessing to our spouse and to die to self, to make a decision today. I want to put this, this ugliness and the selfishness and everything's got to go my way. No, it doesn't. Oh, no, it doesn't. How do you want it done? What do you want to do? Lord, help me to be a servant and to be a blessing. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Let's give God a hand.